Well, hello, everybody. And I, my name is John Barnwell, and I'm here north of the city of Detroit, the Straits, Detroit. And I'm here with my good buddy, Joe Visconti, who has quite a resume. I, I realize that I have to bring it up here just to be able to access some of his accolades here. But he is uh, the uh, president of the American Shakespeare Theater, and he's an Emmy Award winning film producer. And he's also, like myself, is, is engaged with the work of Rudolf Steiner uh, since finding out about him in his teens. And so uh, I always enjoy talking to somebody who's put in the work. And, and it's, it's a challenge because for those of you that are here just because of interest in theater, you may not know that Rudolf Steiner played a very significant role in the history of theater and film and, and the training of actors. And, and it's just, uh, it's really how his work arose really because through his association with Marie von Sievers, who became Marie Steiner after they got married. She was involved in acting in Russia uh, with Stanislavski. And, and that is a, a real key element because if you get into studying Stanislavski at, at all with method acting that's very well known in acting circles, then you'll, of course, be aware of Michael Chekhov. And Michael Chekhov is, is the nephew of the uh, very uh, world famous playwright, Russian playwright Anton Chekhov. And, and uh, Stanislav, Konstantin Stanislavsky referred to Michael Chef Chekhov as his most gifted student. And it's fascinating in that Michael Chekhov ended up journeying to experience what was going on with Rudolf Steiner's work and immediately was struck by the fact of, of, of that there was this clear path towards a deepening of his understanding of the nature of theater and the way in which one can position oneself in relate to uh, the challenges in acting, you know, in method acting, trying to uh, reenact traumas and things like that to get you into the proper frame of reference to act a particular role. Well, that can have lasting effects on one's consciousness. And Michael Chekhov saw this and he realized that, that really Rudolf Steiner was presenting uh, acting as a spiritual path. And it's interesting because he was able to develop his school of acting and it's accessible also for people that don't really have the inclination to, to pursue it in that way. But uh, there's an interesting article uh, on Rudolf Steiner's impact in, in the training of actors and uh, it was came out some time ago by a fellow named Wilson. But it's interesting because he uh, summarizes many important aspects of, of uh, Michael Chekhov's work. But people don't know, but many leading actors <clears throat> were either trained by Michael Chekhov, such as Gary Cooper, Marilyn Monroe, Gregory Peck, Patricia Neal, Clint Eastwood, Leslie Caron, Anthony Quinn, Ingrid Bergman, Jack Palance, Paul Rogers, uh, Lloyd Bridges, and Ewell Brenner. And, th and then there's others th that have adopted the techniques of uh, him, although they haven't studied under him, but it includes Anthony Hopkins, Jack Nicholson, and a host of others. And so you have this, this distinguished uh, acting teacher who was born in 1891 and passed in 1955 and had a huge impact on the world of acting. And so we're here with the president of the American Shakespeare Theater, Joe Visconti, and he is somebody who's spent a great deal of time working into both of these genius 
uh, Russian souls. And so perhaps we can get some clarification as to some of the distinctions between the two and the nature of the influence of Rudolf Steiner on Michael Chekhov's work, especially. Joe, how are you? Pretty good, John. Thanks for having me today. And that was well, a mouthful you just put out there. Yeah, I, well, I had to kind of put my thinking cap on because, <laughs> you know, I, I handle so many diverse subjects that it's a lot to juggle. Well, Rudolf Steiner does say that the ego is the actor. Our, e our true ego is an actor in all the different lives we've lived and the lives within our lives that we all realize as we get older how many lives we've lived in this life. That is the ego that's acting. And there's the theater, the alchemy, alchemy theater that in your dream life. So you're seeing uh, acting, not really what we thought of, what we think of with Hollywood and Broadway. Really, the actor is the ego and the an actor is a true actor, isn't an initiate and the process to clear oneself to become free from from limitations in thinking feeling and willing uh so that you can become an instrument to embody the role that you're going to play um also resounds in our personal life i mean you get up in the morning you put on certain work clothes or whatever your trades or careers are and you start to act immediately we're doing it all day long and uh, we don't call it acting. We don't. We don't think of it. But um, it, it's what it is. And so, uh, with Chekhov, uh, this morning I really spent a few hours on things I've already read. But you know how this is. You could know things tomorrow or yesterday, and you pick something up and you see a new insight. And you just because we change, you find new revelations right within what we already know. And you go, aha. And uh, but. The human being is so important. This is what it's about with the actor. It is the human being. And uh, Chekhov speaks about something um, really interesting with, uh, with science in the why. And this is what I was working on this morning. When we look for the why, even with Rudolf Steiner, much of it in the occult uh, uh, information that he brings down from the Akashic record and from his um, – his partaking with higher beings and being consumed by those higher beings actually to gather the information and all that. Um, what's happening is that the, um, the, the part of our being that is human, that is, um, that is transcendental is, is always present. And uh, Chekhov speaks about in the why we'll find that in our materialistic science and he's speaking about Rudolf Steiner's um, anthroposophy at this point, and he explains that as actors or initiates or human beings, we can't be concerned when we're going to act or do. We have to be concerned with the how. And when we do anything, even studying Steiner, as we talk about what we're doing today, it is the how that everything happens. The miracles, Goethe, the miracles happen when there's a commitment, when there's a decision, when there's activity and action. And uh, the left brain materialistic mechanistic model of the world, uh, even with anthroposophy, if you try to build a cosmology that's kind of like parts of a Tesla or something, it doesn't work that way. It's when it's alive and it's living and it's being used and you're breathing and you're experiencing that the knowledge, the wisdom becomes alive and becomes being. And this is the whole key to theater, to acting, which is why everyone loves to pretend and act since you were little kids to, to uh, Halloween, to anything. Who doesn't like to put their hat on and put on a roll or a mask? And all of a sudden you realize that the imagination, which is really the creative writer in all of us. Um, so Chekhov really takes Steiner's spiritual um, anthroposophy and he adopts it. Uh, and he explains in a lot of his, uh, he has two books out that I left down, downstairs on the dining room table. I should have brought them up. Um, he explains how all of his different things like the psychological gesture, the imagination, the archetypes. He goes through this whole litany of, of um, processes in um, classes and challenges for the actor to redundantly work on 
because it's through redundancy in uh, called rehearsal that uh, the and, and in life the same thing the more you do something the more you become better at it but what i found fascinating is he addresses something that rudolf steiner addresses too and i really want to get your take on this john and it's about how um with Chekhov in this instance and it happens in life he speaks about how we are to look beyond the cliche and how someone picks up their hat how they take their hat we're to study it uh, a person is in a natural environment doing something, or maybe it's got its glasses, and to watch it, not to mimic it as much as to absorb what they do in real life. And Steiner, he quotes Steiner, that Steiner says the problem with all these people that are in spiritual science or in the world of theater is that they aren't connected to the human being and the actual ways that people do things. So what, uh, what occurs is you study that, um, as an actor from any technique that you're seeing people naturally do any this is really important it's just like what we talk about john he says we take that we do it we move it around we look at it and then we let it go into our subconsciousness and sink into unconsciousness and this is what i want to talk to you about or get your take on this and then it comes back like anthroposophy or the things we do it comes back when you need it that whole process of how anything in life is learned experienced falls down into the unconscious forgotten and then comes out of the land of forgotten into our senses into the elemental beings into our movements into our gestures in the 12 senses how miraculously almost like when jesus is this and we'll go that way goes into the tombs the rudolf steiner speaks about the cosmos and all the hierarchies did not know for three days what was going to happen he sunk into not just into hell into a world and it's almost like a black hole comes out the other side and so much of our life it, People don't trust that. That's the spirit. And they don't trust their own intuitions. They don't trust their own uh, inclination sometimes because they don't know. They're looking for the me mechanistic model, which has a link and a chain and a rope and a, a circuit that's always connecting. But there must be a disconnect and allowing to almost like forgiveness, let go and let it sink like, you know, in the end of the Titanic, the kid sinks into the water. It has to sink back down into the unconscious, into the spirit. And then it's almost like the sword from King Arthur comes back with the Lady of the Lake. It comes back up. John, I'm going to zip it. Tell me what you're thinking about those things of the unconscious and how things come back. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, the the great uh, literary example of of working with that archetypal scenario has to do with uh, Captain Ahab and and the the quest for the white whale, right? These the Moby Dick. What is that? What's going on there? You know, is what does this big white whale represent? The, that surges up out of the ocean. It's like, it's as if he's taking the human psychology and he's representing it within the forces of nature so that this white whale is like that demon of the unconsciousness that like that you're referring to. And, and he's attempting to conquer this uh, demon of the unconscious, the white whale, you know, and the, you have Queequeg, the, the Indian who's who's doing his little uh, ritual on, on the deck, and 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 he's making prognostications about what's coming up, about the the whole dreaded scenario that's unfolding. And so you look at that, and you see that there's it, it goes back to what Goethe's in, in Goethe's Faust, where Goethe says, two souls, alas, dwell within my breast." And he's referring to one that's striving to just try and, and act on every urge and compulsion and, and just grab the, the whole world and just take it in wholesale. And then that other element that's striving for the absolute, that's striving for the spiritual world and the realm of the divine, the divine spiritual beings. And it was kind of uh, a conflicted, uh, nature that Rudolf Steiner clarifies 
really uh, succinctly in his lecture cycle on initiation uh, from the Egyptian mysteries to the Holy Grail. And in there, he talks about in chapter or uh, lecture four, he gets into talking about how in the ancient world that things were together so that in the ancient mysteries, uh, art and music and theater and science, they were all together. And as we uh, received our inspirations through our clairvoyance in, in the earlier stages, the further back in history you go before Christ, that you, you find that there's greater and greater capacity for this clairvoyance. And Rudolf Steiner develops the idea that we're descending into materiality. And so when you get into the Greco-Roman period in 747 BC, that you've entered into a, a more material uh, relationship to the world, a more wakeful nature rather than the dreamy state of the ancient Egyptians and, and Babylonians and so on. And, and going all the way back to, you know, the Stone Age in India. But uh, I don't want to get caught up in too much yeah, descriptive. Yeah, yeah. Well, but the, I want to make the point because what happens there, he says that these things in the ancient world were united. But as we entered into materiality, they, they separated out. And so now you have, well, I study art. Well, I study science. Well, I study, right, right. you know, and it's all separated off. He says, but that's not the only thing that happened, that there was a part of our inner soul nature that was able to maintain a communion with the spiritual world, but that, in a sense, died. That right. way of doing things passed into oblivion, and those things became unconscious. And so what now modern people are, are striving at, especially since 1413, 1414, the beginning of the conscious no soul period, is that we're working with something that gives access to the adversarial forces in an unconscious way. And so we act out of these uh, nefarious inspirations, so to well, speak, unknowingly. Chekhov goes on to um, talk about something interesting. He never really speaks about the, the uh, basic terminology of Rudolf Stein, of etheric body, astral body. He doesn't mention those. He does talk about an, an um, imaginary body that we can create. And we create this imaginary body as an extension of our being, and we can project it out. He's not using hypnosis in this case, but he's explaining that we are under the control. He always teaches the techniques to create and project outside so that your physical body, in one instance, is no longer important. It's the periphery that the audience is going to be watching because his techniques show you how to use the imagination. The other, Another um, uh, instrument that he, he teaches is the... We talked about this in one of the last shows, the, the psychological gesture, such as grasping. And you work on something. So you say a line from Hamlet, but you walk in the room to speak it, and you're grasping in your inner gesture. He has you, the actors, trained to, to actually grasp while they're saying the words and then forget the grasping. So the, the grasping, or, or it could be clutching, or it could be all these, any different, uh, he has a whole, he calls them tricks, all these different tricks we can create that we're dancing and we're moving inside of ourselves. It's a gesture, but when we deliver a certain line, the performance, the audience will pick up on the gesture, which is hidden. They don't know it's hidden, but they'll pick that up. The words mean something different. So it's amazing. He really goes down the rabbit hole. And you'd have to study some of his works to see how far it goes, but he's speaking about um, the etheric body expanding. He's think he's speaking about the, aura and the astral body. He never says these words. And so his techniques, whether he knew them and masked them or whether I think he must have known what they were. He was with all of them um, in the 20s and, and enough of the time to understand one of his publishers did not want to print one of the books because it was so deep into techno spiritual that uh, I think they edited the book that is out now. Uh, the, the actor techniques of a modern actor. Um, but what's important for all of us to connect that with spirituality, and this is the disconnect where the art 
and life disconnect from knowledge in the why. Because we do things we don't know why. Then there's the how I spoke about earlier. Why is so important, but not to performance. And this is why we can do different things. This is the reason and meanings are not connected with action. And, and not supposed to be. Why are you doing that? Oh, I'm, I'm fixing the chimney. Why? Well, well, it's broken. Why? The tree hit it. It doesn't matter. I'm pointing and I've got mortar and I'm putting bricks on. That activity versus the basic motivation is stripped away. The actor needs to let go of the why. And that's where the scientific left brain materialistic model grabs a hole in politics too and tries to shove itself and push out the how. Because it's in the how, and especially in a group form, that the, each one of these things I just spoke about now work with an activ activity in a group for a performance, even a small performance of three or four actors. Then there's another synergy and another spirit that starts to take over. And the actor can become, he talks about the supervised consciousness, can take over witnessing everything that's going on between all the other actors but that's not the thinking mind that the actor's using. So you have a double, no, two, two, two souls in my heart, <laughs> two different uh, consciousnesses. And so you develop a higher conscious that monitors and watches what's happening. And then there's a consciousness that's doing the how. And it's just amazing because the way what's wrong with society is everyone in the world right now is just running off of redundant um wise in doing what they're doing for money and material existence in the the uh soul and the spirit are drained the short circuited because we can't live just we have a lot of bills we have problems so we want a lot of money to run away from the bills so that we can live in a fantasy a luciferic fantasy but we're supposed to enjoy the daily task no matter how small it is and and actually delve in and challenge this at home if you're watching or, or listening. Challenge any activity you're going to do. Go make a piece of toast. Go out and start the car. Wipe off the windshield. Anything you do, start to do with more intention. Look at not just gratefulness and what it is, but start to become part of what you're doing. Have the ego. That's what they call um, performing in the now, in the moment. Have your ego and your consciousness participate in a very flowing, rhythmic, breathing, natural way versus the anxiety that's gripping everyone. I got to get this done and finished and accomplished and done as a task driven because, and the because is connected to the why. And they run right over the breathing heart function of that living moment. And this is why everything we do in life the acting is only an example. It's it's an art form that it shows and actually can show the public always for thousands of years can show the public what they do. And then humor comes in. He brings in humor, which is really important because that is the whole point is to bring humor into the consciousness um, and watch what's happening. The humor makes the why meaningless. And so, you, again, I, we're all about why. Why is this happening? Where did this come from? It's especially anthroposophy. That, but once you step into the art realm, it has to be let go. And the focus has to be about, and this is why, forgiveness, Jesus healing, um, all the things we hear about. But what about what they did and why they did it and their karma? It doesn't matter. You're working the karma out by activity and love, spontaneous awake, aware, and interactive versus the the debt, the karmic debt, or the reasons why all of that will be gamed on us by dark, I will call them darker forces. So the theater and the uh, practice of the grail and the practice of, of all these things that we're attempting can't really work without the how, without doing, and it doesn't matter what you do. So this is another thing. Why would it matter? Doesn't this specifically have to be tied to the karma of the thing? The, the why? No, no, no. And so a great actor, a great initiate, a person who's got their ego as best they can. I mean, the lower ego is about the real true ego working. He speaks about that, Chekhov. The ego works within you and you're working with your higher ego right on the piece. It's the awareness of it and the, the pushing back of Armin and Lucifer, both different ways 
or one will want to bring you into ridiculous Lucifer, ridiculous the, pl the play and the or the role you're playing will just be an aberration. Or are men who would want to stiffen you so that you can't you cannot act. And here's the other thing: the hands, the physical gestures are not supposed to be really used. We do so much with the face, but the face has really has to be um, utilized less. And you can see that with Robert De Niro. Somebody I don't like politically, but you can see that with De Niro. You can see it with Clint Eastwood. Do you know how much energy it takes not to move, to stand there for three minutes or Jack Nicholson and just pull in and breathe? The less is more. Not acting, not happy feet, not moving around to articulate the script, but to allow the script to come through you. Your turn. <laughs> yeah. The Well, one of the best examples I, I it, you brought to mind is uh, this young uh, director was working with Robert Duvall and he was doing this film and Robert Duvall was just supposed to be an old guy sitting in a chair and, and saying some lines. A very, very, just a cameo role. And so they do the scene and then they get it done. He goes, oh, that, that was great. Let's do it again. He says, no, just check the dailies. It's done. And he gets up and, and, and walks off. And the guy's like, he's freaking out, right? He's like, he, he's so paranoid that, that it needs to be fixed or something, you know? And because uh, all, all, all uh, Duvall did was, was talk the lines and, and then get up out of his chair and leave, you know? Yeah. And he went back to see the dailies and it absolutely floored him. Yeah. It totally changed his whole perspective on acting. You'll, you'll see some some actors that, that have a lot of stage experience tend to, tend to overdo it a bit, you know, like yeah. uh, Richard Burt, Burt for example, you know, he, he, he would talk too loud, you know, he's not on stage. We don't need to hear it in the back of the place, you know, but they, they have just been doing it that way for so long that they have these booming voices, you know, yeah. like, Oh, you know, but that being said, there's also that, that whole quality of speech that, that is, is nurtured within uh, Rita Steiner's approach on acting and recitation and poetry and all of that and there's a there's a brief quote i want to share with you because it it brings in elements that that people don't consider normally and it's in this uh, lecture cycle that's in english as poetry in the art of speech and he says the real poet always goes back from the prosaic or literal to the musical or plastic before he committed the words of a poem to paper, Schiller always experienced a wordless, indeterminate melody, a soul experience of melody. And yet, without words, it flowed along melodically like a musical theme, under which he then threaded the words. One might conjecture that Schiller could have conjured the most varied poems as regards verbal content out of the same musical theme. And to rehearse his iambic verse dramas, Goethe stood in front of his actors with a baton like a conductor, considering the formation of sound, the balance of the syllables, the musical rhythm and time signature to be the essential rather than the literal meaning. For this reason, it has become necessary for our own spiritual stream to return to a true art of recitation and declamation, where what has been debased through the means of expression imposed upon the poet to the level of mere prose can once again be raised so as to regain the level of a super sensible formative and musical experience. And that's uh, Collected Works Volume 281. So that kind of encases some of the, the ideas that you're sharing, that it's, it's that milieu that it's taking place rather than the thing itself. Right. And the thing you just quoted actually gets down to the simple phrase. It's um, being, being is being conveyed to the audience. There, there's an interaction in spiritual being. Um, the actor will bring the role, the experience, the meaning, and everything we talked about, and the whys and all that, that comes through the performance. So this is life. 
And you can think about this in your own daily life. You walk into a party and people are there, whatever, you know them, it's a holiday, whatever the situation is. And you can feel, everyone feels it. That was a great party. I felt a lot of love. You feel something changing, especially at a party where it's lighter, there's a little drink and, and you're more receptive and open. You'll see the and feel that exchange um, of, of life force. I'll just call it that. That's what's happening in the theater. And if it's not done correctly, what happens is it takes the life out of the audience. It drains the audience. And this is what's occurring. The materialistic science and the materialistic ad adaption and the non-human. Uh, and I don't mean just in tragic situations or, or uh, you know, a, a part of a, a play where there's a, a buildup a crescendo, and then all of a sudden the audience cries because it hit them so hard. All during the course of the performance is so important for each act, each page, each paragraph to be conveyed by and what's occurring is that lesson that the Greeks bring in, the tragedies and the comedies, uh, and even Shakespeare, the, those things that are coming in are actually a, a bringing a catharsis. But the catharsis doesn't happen by just watching, as we were told, watching TV and it happens. There's actually a spiritual, almost like a mass, there's a spiritual happening. In Again, I'm going to say this to those who may not have heard me say it before. What is spirit? Spirit is, is consciousness and life beyond the organic process and beyond the 12 senses if you believe in only five. It is life and consciousness beyond what we can measure and sense. And this is where immortality lies. So when we say spirit, most of our life and the earth, the spirit of the earth is feeding us. We think it's just the water and the clouds. And no, there's elemental forces, there's spiritual being pouring forth their life, just like in Genesis. And it's constantly, it's up to mankind now to be able to teach, educate, help, and cure through sharing. And we are now giving the life force to others. And we're using our spirit to embody the role and put it out, even if it's in your daily task, even in your work, and you're at work and you're doing something and you're at a little meeting, anywhere you go, acting acting um, is so important because you're bringing confidence you're projecting strength you're project whatever it is you want to project and uh, you're partaking in the drama of your karma in theater it's the you're partaking in the drama of the role and the message that's in the play or the um, or the uh, film that you happen to be watching but it's really a transference of life force and i can't ex express that enough which is why it comes from the heart chakra the lungs from the middle man um and it doesn't come from the head organization and it doesn't even come from the, uh, the will organization all those have to be in complete control uh, and this is where Chekhov goes into all and he does his exercise this is important he does his exercise and he um numbers them and what you have to do is almost like what rudolf steiner's exercise is simple one the, the five exercises and then he combines all five into a six where there's a combo you have to take all these exercises and strip away the aromatic numbers well i'm supposed to do number one before number two and number three in that sequence in order not so once you start to master like anything else you start to commingle and mix and adapt at will what you need and strip away the lessons that were given under numerical value because that catches a lot of people thinking as they're learning that they need to remember number one and number four and get caught up with that it's these exercises are laid out for people to be able to take each topic the psychological gesture imagination the archetypes uh, every one of them he puts on Stanislavski also the problem one of the problems is that no one is speaking about why really the question is what does theater do what does it br it brings life it rejuvenates it recreates and the elemental forces that are behind all of it which are behind all dramatic situations in your life or in the world are elemental forces that are being torn from good and evil because that's what Chekhov really gets into the the good and evil, that constant battle, the darkness, the darkness and the the light and the shadow, over and over, they're materializing and they're spiritual entities and beings. This is why it's so spiritual. Um, and our world hasn't been trained in that. The word spirit has been beaten like, you know, nobody believes in that. It kind of means religion. 
and that's not the case. And so a rejuvenation, uh, a revival in theater, a revival in your daily life uh, to be conscious of just how you're co-creating with the cosmos and hierarchies constantly. We are co-creating. We're just not participating consciously and understanding what we do. Absolutely. And Rudolf Steiner once made the remark, and he's made it in more than one occasion, but he, he said, uh, there are no insignificant things in life. And it, that plays on what you're talking about, that whole idea of gesture. And when you really enter into a character in acting and you're, you're getting into the minutia so far, but you want it to appear as though it's just naturally occurring. And you get certain actors that are so gifted at, like, uh, I, I always give the example of Gary Oldman because, I mean, he's he's so profound in the way he can take up a character. And uh, if you look at his, uh, all the films that he's done, his voice is different in all of them. And I I eventually heard him on uh, a talk show and his his day-to-day -day talking voice is entirely different from all the other voices that I was familiar with. And when, whether he's a, a Hungarian Dracula, or he's a, a, a Rastafarian drug dealer, or, you know, could just go down the list. I mean, he, when he goes into that, that political film he did with Jeff Bridges, and he's like the, the, uh, political uh, hack guy who's, and he's like kind of sloughing along and dragging his, the way he, just the way he walked. Yeah. You look at him and you go, I know that guy. That was my vice principal in high school. You know, it's like, it's just amazing that he inhabits these characters. Yes, yes. And in order to be that uh, uh, versatile, you have to have a capacity to be selfless. Because if you're, you're so caught up in your personality. That's just like a lot of character actors. They just, they don't even try to go there. That's that's either not called for for them or that they just decide to do it a, a different way or they're, that's what they're capable of doing. But they just, every time you see them, it's them uh, with different lines, you know? And so it's just a completely different take, not to disrespect it. Yeah. Well, you can, uh, the, I think the greatest thing with drama and acting is that people with problems, they do drama therapy, but you can actually create and imagine your way out, just like your self-help books show you. You know, when I was doing hypnotherapy, when I was in television in Miami, I went through the whole process of what is this hypnosis? What do they do? How does it work? Subliminal messages. And I have a book on scripts and every word for whatever the problem you're having, smoking or weight loss, whatever, sleepless nights, every word is crafted in a certain way that you don't trigger the subconscious mind to react a certain way in script writing. And why I'm saying this is we can write scripts for ourselves and mantras to get ourselves out of where we are. If we're having karmic problems with finances or loved ones, we can actually individually write a script and you can imagine and bring yourself into being, you can try it on something small, just take anything today, a little and write a few words and uh, maybe a sentence on something, clone it down the way you feel, then bring your feeling into this script, imagine it, decide to put it on as though it's something you choose to do. No one's making you do it. Say these words over and over. Think about them over a course of days, maybe even weeks if you need to. And there's nothing you cannot overcome because what's occurring is you are using, it's better to know what you do, but you are using the power of words, your will forces, your consciousness, why you want to get out of this problem, why you want to transcend it, why you want to help someone else. Um, and so the, all of these techniques of Chekhov and Stanislavski and others, um, um, uh, Boleslavski, all of them can be utilized in your business, in your daily tasks to make you a clear person that's, that's objective, forgiving, <laughs> forgive yourself first, that overcomes your habits, which is the big thing for actors, the idiosyncrasies and things we all have. To work on those and remove them is very hard, which is why old men and others have picked up the techniques and changed. They're able to change 
they have command of their idiosyncrasies to the twitches, to the to the kinks of the shoulder, to whatever. I'm sitting like this. I'm doing something today for you that you haven't seen. Look, what watch what I'm doing. Watch how I'm sitting with my arms. I'm doing this, and my body's in a complete weird position. It looks good, but I'm not comfortable. But I can do that, and, and it's taking us from three dimensional, two dimensional. But what we do when we know what we're doing. And this is great with the gestures because the head like this may mean something. The head like that may mean something. They mean more than just body movements. And so when we start to co create, um, we can change our daily lives. Uh, we don't. We won't need to be harnessed to, to film and 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 all that. We'll start, people can individually. This is where I may be getting into. This has been racking my brains for a long time. Kind of like self help, spiritual stuff. But at the same time, it really gets down to performance. It gets down to understanding how you perform, why you want to perform a certain way in your job or in your family life, taking stock in the mirror of how you're doing it, filming yourself with the camera and realizing how you walk. Geez, I walk kind of funny. Why do I do that with my leg? You ever do put a camera on yourself and walk around the room and you're like, I didn't know I look like that. I didn't know I stand like that. I didn't know you don't know. We don't know what we look like to the world. Nobody really does. The actors do because they're constantly getting photos, taking them in videos and, uh, you know, in rehearsals. So they know that every move and every posture and or, or not is, is sending a message to the world. It, and it definitely is. Um, harming ourselves also, yet we don't know it. And so really acting, drama, all of it really is so helpful. And, and I think more children need to partake in it. And this is something they've stripped away, the arts, the classics, the participation in writing, brainstorming, um, performing, all, all different performance. And it's been removed from, from education. It's the worst thing. Um, for children, they need to be able to get on stage, whatever it is, like when they were two, three, four, five, six, seven years old, and they didn't have any inhibitions, and especially from seven to 14, be able to not, as they become more self conscious of their body and the changes, still be able to be. Um, because this is where karma can be, and this is important. People say things were made in karma, and you did. But the moment you become aware, of, Rudolf Steiner says it, become aware of the karma. Not even the why, but it's happening. You can change it. But to change it takes the ability to transform yourself as an actor would do, as a Gary Oldman would do, into the better person or the other person you want to become. And so this is much, much, much more than drama, film. It's really about our daily lives. We're doing it all day long. And uh, we've convinced ourselves we're a certain person. And we are all typecasted when we can become free. Yes, it, it, it enters into a, a lot of uh, really comp complex things that actually are quite approachable. Uh, you know, just the, the concept of temperaments, the four temperaments, for example. But if you get into uh, looking at this uh, more closely, you see that it's it's has to do with being able to, to come to consciousness regarding things because it's really hard to change a habit you don't even know you have, right? right. <laughs> it's like, how are you supposed to do that? Yeah, well, uh, I, I've had my own exposure to, we've discussed this before, but I've had my own exposure to uh, the theater, and uh, which is... To me, interesting, you know. I, I mean, I was involved in the in the music business for a long time, but I also had a lot of associations with people through that and 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 other ways into the world of theater, you know, because the lead singer of the band that I had uh, was was the understudy for Berger in the Detroit cast of Hair, which was like the perhaps the most celebrated hair cast for, as far as the vocal abilities you know like meatloaf was part of the cast and sean murphy who worked with eric clapton and bob seeger and has her own wonderful career one just a, a very dear old friend of mine and and a lot of other denny fairchild and all these people and there'd be these big parties out at, at uh, the orchard lake house it was called but it was the home of uh, steve farmer from the amboy dukes 
band with Ted Nugent and, and this whole group of people. I won't get into it. take too long just to name them off, but it was one of those rock and roll commune type things with a huge yard. And Jerome Ragney, who was one of the creators of hair, and all these people would come in from New York and we'd have these uh, incredible parties, you know, Alice Cooper would be there and all these, all these people milling around. So I was in that milieu. And it, it's wonderful to note that, that uh, if you have the capacity to be able to, to, to stand up before a crowd of people and offer them something, that's a real skill. That's that if you go to an elite school in like say New York, the, the Ivy League elite school, there's a requirement that's that, that unknown to people that just go to public schools. But every week, every every day you have to write a paper. And, but at the end of the week, you're gonna have to get up there and you're gonna have to present that paper to the class. And you may not, but you don't know. So you, you gotta make sure that you're ready. And so that that's a big, big part of, of being able to participate in things on a level of leadership. Yeah. And, and and so if if you're not making your way through life, I like, for example, in Waldorf schools, they, geez, uh, pretty much every year they win the competition with the, the, the band that they have there, you know, because they're, they're just so accommodated to, to because the performance is a part of Waldorf education and having to get up in front of the class and do things. And so you really unfold aspects of your personality and to be able to socially relate to other people. And it's just a whole dynamic sphere of activity that you're, you're, you're gifting this child to. But you can, you can also see what you're speaking about with music. I mean, music is theater. Uh, music is in the word, in the spoken word. Look, just think of Christopher Walken's speech patterns and the way he speaks. If that isn't musical, the way he speaks, or others, um, Richard Burton, whoever they happen to be. But the, the key here is, and it's so important why people are really drawn to things, is because there's a blessing that comes. We have the power as actors to bless and it's why they, they can become a God complex if it's Hollywood, you know, and, and, and all that. But, <laughs> but there's a power to actually bless people and, and convey. So I kept saying the being is conveyed and actually to feed. I mean, your mass, you're looking at that. It's done a different way. But there's a complete blessing and a giving of life and, uh, and raising of consciousness. And that's the key. To raise the consciousness to be able to give the life is the blessing. And the audience participation is key to the entire mass. Let's just call the whole dang thing instead of a show, a mass. To the whole participation in the proper rhythm um, for spiritual beings to come in at our invitation in our modern time, not being led anymore by them. And so much more important today for re religious ceremony, for, um, for performance in theater, music for the public to um, raise their consciousness to realize that we are all leading and supporting and feeding each other now with the help of the spiritual hierarchies, not with the dominance in the Old Testament, the way things were, and even up to the uh, age of Gabriel here, it ended in 1879. We're now being led to choose how we want to govern ourselves act, lead, and help. So the spiritual reality is also part of your arts because only through the arts do you really get that science and religion put together. And it has to end up being human. And that's the key. It must, through Christ, become human. It won't work as a techno-digitized thing. It's got to be the human because only the human can feed the human. And the essence of it is... is uh... Given uh, the quote that you love to, to refer to because it's so potent is, is 1 Corinthians uh, 6.12, St. Paul, everything is permissible for me, but not everything is helpful. Everything is permissible for me. That's but crazy. I will, but I will not allow anything to control me. And that's the key. See, right. and, and, and if my brother sees me, 
doing what's permissible, which I can control, and thinks he can do it. Oh, wretched man that I am, I'll wear sackcloth and ashes so my brother doesn't fall into sin and error because he saw me as an example. That's really duty, okay? That's way above. And those I can do it, all things are permissible. All things are lawful, but they are not expedient or helpful. And uh, and again, the spiritual world is here for all of us. It's We came out of it, we're going back to it. But there is evolutionary patterns, according to Rudolf Steiner. The people and our churches didn't show us. It's the same monotonous mass our whole life. But the world is much more than that, the spiritual world. And it's been put into a system, almost like a government system in our religions. And it's dead. That's why they're dead. There was no more life could be given. If the sponge is wrung out, there's nothing left to give because mankind needed more and it wasn't given more. But another, uh, I, I I tell this story time and time again, because, but because it's so... It's so powerful, but uh, for people that don't know, I think because we, I think we will attract some new people just because of the subject, but they don't know that. But uh, I spent years at the Waldorf Institute of Teacher Training, and that was run by Werner Gloss, who used to run uh, uh, the training in in uh, Hollywood, and so he knew everybody in Hollywood. Would. And, uh, you know, that's how uh, my best friend, Douglas Gabriel, ended up being the consultant uh, that came up with the the uh, scripts for, for Star Wars and, and Poltergeist and, and uh, Indiana Jones and on and on and on. So, you know, we were mixing with this these people, but Werner Gloss was like uh, a, a key mentor, and he was a, uh, his mentor was was Walter Johannes Stein, the author of Ninth Century: The World History in the Light of the Holy Grail. That's coming out of the work of Rudolf Steiner. And but uh, Werner, I used to take him out to dinner after class, and and I I ply him for stories, and he would tell I got would get him to tell stories about Marilyn Monroe. And she actually had called Werner to come talk to her because she was really feeling down, and he could. He said he couldn't do it because he had to give a lecture that night, and and the next day, of course, she was gone, and so uh, he was one of the last people to speak to her. But she was a, an avid uh, student of Rudolf Steiner's work, and there's a, a book on Norma Jean: The Life of Marilyn Monroe by uh, Fred Lawrence Skiles and uh, came out in 1969. But uh, there's a, a quotation on page uh, 31 and 32. It says, it says, some years before her death in, in 1964, Dame Edith Sitwell, the noted poet, uh, had spent a winter in Hollywood. A meeting between the poetess and Marilyn was arranged by a monthly magazine. It was thought their opposite personalities would throw off some journalistic sparks. No one could have foreseen that they would have become immediate friends, nor could anyone have known that their deaths would be marked in an almost identical way while their legends were growing in their lifetimes. They had been taken seriously by too few too late. By the time she met Dame Edith, Marilyn had come a long way. If she had not been moving in an atmosphere, much of it self-created, so removed from her beginning, they might have had nothing in common. But when the introductions were over, these new and unlikely friends were left alone and began talking of Rudolf Steiner. You know, and 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 then it yeah. goes on, whose personal history, the course of my life, Marilyn was reading at the time. Dame Edith was remarked later on Marilyn's extreme intelligence. And so, uh, I mean, it's just, there's a lot of surprising things in life when you start to see people that you didn't realize were profoundly influenced by Rudolf, like Sting, for example, him and his wife, Trudy. They're like really into Steiner, you know, yeah. it's like. Well, there, there's something else that's important with Rudolf Steiner. Um, the whole key to anthroposophy of Rudolf Steiner isn't, you can encompass it in one word. And the actor always has to search for that word. And that word is truth. What we're finding from everything we've studied over the, I don't know, 50 years for me plus, 
you too, and just letting these things weigh on you as you're finding the spirit of truth for certain, and the truth is unchangeable. And it's not like Puncher's Pilot is my truth, the same as yours. It's reality. It's truth. And this people are like, well, what's the truth? What's the whole truth in court of nothing but the truth? Just think about that for anything. Describing an event that just occurred. You can only describe for what you participated in or consciousness of it if you're on a witness stand. You don't know what other people in the group may have been thinking or doing. You can only talk about what you perceived. That's not hearsay. And so the spirit of truth, Steiner brings this through anthroposophy. This is the key to the whole thing. This is what the Christ center is all about. It has to be true. And when you're performing or when you're doing anything, everybody, the good thing about America is everybody is the greatest critic in the world. We've been bombarded with performances, even little kids, their whole life. And so we know something that's good or the better word is true. And we don't really use that word when we're talking like this, but it, there's a completeness there's an ah moment when you find out if evidence is dropped and people see something and they go, oh, oh, that's what it was. And you know the truth now. And that feeling of merging with reality. I had your hand up, so go ahead. Yeah. Well, I just wanted to say the, the word authenticity, you know, that uh, you see so much today. It's just fake. I mean, you watch. That's, that's, the, that's the word for truth. It's authenticity. Yeah. Real. Yeah. Okay. You see these talking heads today on TV and they're just sitting there and they're, geez, they're lying almost every everything they say and they know they are. Yes. And it's like, or or they may be lying and, and unconsciously. They don't know. They've, they're just going along with the programming, you know, so that it's, it's really the attention to detail, like the old saying, the devil is in the details. Yeah. It's, it's really well, true. We're, we're seeing through in politics, through Twitter and everything, in the whole, and, and forget about left or right, Trump or this one, that doesn't matter. What matters is everybody is able to see what's happened in the last five, six years. Uh, Kennedy being killed, CA involvement, everything, UFOs, um, the squelching of stuff. It's all evident. Whether there'll be justice or whether, and here's the other thing, Maybe Trump and the rest of them deserve that from another life. We haven't talked about that. Or whoever you like on whatever side of the aisle, maybe they deserve that. So, again, when we look for justice personally, we think, well, they got away with it. They weren't prosecuted. That's part of the play. <laughs> you yeah. know, it's visible. We're all, like Christ says, we're, everything's uncovered. Nothing's hidden. So we're all able to look through each other's karma, our challenges, uh, what we feel is right or wrong, helpful, not helpful. This is a great time because of it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that the, in being able to to uh, have a once removed vantage point from your experience of being you is 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 a real key. And in one of uh, Rudolf Steiner's uh, most important works, the Philosophy of Freedom. Uh, otherwise, uh, sometimes publishes the philosophy of spiritual activity, but in there he he describes the development of the ability to observe your thinking. Right, and, and, and by I mentioned by, that with the supervised consciousness of the actor. This is where Chekhov gets it from. That supervised consciousness watching over you doing what you're doing in acting. Yes, it's, it's self-reference it is is in essence, what we're talking about. And if you can gain that once removed vantage point, but yet when you get into Rudolf Steiner's work and he, he makes so much emphasis on the threefold nature of a human being so that a, uh, an individual is thinking, feeling, and will. And most people, it never crossed their mind. You know, it's, it's like, it's just all blurred together. And you can ask somebody, well, what do you think about this? And they say, well, I feel well, no, I didn't ask you what you felt. I said, I want to know what you think about it, you know. Well, he also speaks about how those are being separated since 1899. They're being separated now in our time, thinking, feeling, and willing, where they never were like that. They're all, and this is why you see dysfunction, chaos, uh, in individual lives, in groups. And it takes a lot of discipline 
and organization and commitment under any task really to hold things together. Well, look at some of the football teams like Tom Brady last night. Great player. The team's great. Same team as last year. They just can't think. They don't have it together. They're thinking, feeling, willing. <laughs> just an ordinary life is not together. Yeah. And so when you get into that, I used to I used to go hang out with with Del Close, who founded. Uh, he's one of the founders of Second City in Chicago, and so he he trained a lot of the people that people would know from Saturday Night Live and all that, you know, Ackroyd Bellucci and Chevy Chase and going all the Eddie Murphy going, they, it's such a huge list of people, Gilda Radner, on and on and on, and it would be so fun because he was he was teaching a course out out at Le Say International, which is a French acting academy that that. There was a school that wasn't being used in in uh, Birmingham area here in Michigan, and and so they moved in there and it became an acting school. And he would come in and the whole gymnasium, the, every it would be packed, standing room only, and I get to sit right next to Dell up up on the on the the uh, the dias, I guess you would call it. Yeah. But uh, and he would go through. Uh, People coming up on stage, and he would he would shout down, uh, "Okay, you're a you're a rasher of bacon now," <laughs> <laughs> and, they, and they would have to pull off their version of a rasher. That's the imagination. Bacon. That's the imagination, yeah. and, and let it let it lead. Uh, and we squash our imagination. Everybody does. We did when we were little, and we don't. Certain times during the day or weekends or doing something, pretending we're something, but that pretend that imagination is really really the the gateway if it's if it can be allowed to flourish creatively in our daily lives and be the script writer for what we want and i'll get religious on you where jesus said whatever you want ask in the father's name what you want and you will have it you have he says it three times you have not asked yet asking is imagining Asking is reaching out. What do you want? What do you want to become? What do you want to do? You don't need to know why, even though why is so important, because we may never really know our own personal past life karmas or this karma, this life that things work out. But we can know that we want to. And that desire can be turned into new actions and helpfulness and healing uh, to ourselves and others. But the, the, being a trained actor, you can do it yourself at home, buy the books, go through it, study it, and realize what you're doing. It's a, it's a really neat way where it's not pathology, it's not self-help. Chekhov's books, Stanislavski's, really help everybody work on themselves and know what they look like, know what they act like. You have to. Before you can put on another role, you've got to take yours off. <laughs> I guess yeah, we're out yeah. of time. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, we're getting near the end of this, and I, I have a... Uh another uh place i have to be but uh i i want to share with you uh i'm the author of two books this is the arcana of the grail angel the spiritual science of the holy blood and of the holy grail a study developed out of the work of russ steiner of the underground streams of esoteric christianity which flowed from the Brotherhood of the Holy Grail to the Order of the Knights Templar and the True Rosicrucian Order, as a forward by my best buddy, Douglas Gabriel, and has great many diagrams in it. And the whole series of diagrams is uh, duplicated in my second book, the My Grail Diagrams, as they're called. And uh, that lays out the cosmological uh, methodology of, of Rudolf Steiner's spiritual science uh, in very elaborate detail. Now, the first book, The Arcana of the Grail Angel, I, I'm, it's uh, soon to be reprinted. I have to carve out the time to do the edits I have to do, but you could still get the this second volume, The Arcana of Light on the Path, by clicking on the link on, on YouTube here below uh, my academia page. I, I have it down there. And so if you're interested in that sort of thing, you, you might want to check it out. And it's uh, uh, available. Also, you can contact me uh, through private message on Facebook. And so it'll work out for anybody, whether they're in the US or not. It doesn't matter. But uh, and if you want to buy me a cup of coffee, that's paypal.me forward slash John Barnwell 888. And uh, Joe, you didn't give me information to that 
effect. So I, I don't have anything to share. If you do, by all means. I'm I'm all set now. You're all set. Well, that's excellent. Well, I, I, I it's such a pleasure talking to you. And there's there's so many things I was planning on getting to that I didn't. But that's the beauty of these conversations that I have. That uh, I I'm dedicated to this quest to the extent of that I never quite get everything in. And that's a, probably a good thing in retrospect. But I want to thank you all for uh, checking in on us. And I want to thank Joe for showing up and being his indomitable self. And so uh, we'll just see you on the other end of something.